They've got like a hundred five-star football players on their defense. They have a defensive lineman that weighs 340 pounds and, and runs better than everybody on this call. Five-star recruits everywhere and they play really physical. Damn. I think Memphis played more mature than we did. I think that, uh, which I don't even know exactly what that means, but they are more advanced than we were. And then um, sometimes morale doesn't need to be boosted. Now you need to boost something, but it's not always morale that needs to be boosted. And between now and tomorrow, I'm going to figure out what it is that needs to be boosted. And whether I'm right or not, we're going to boost something. Well, you know, like I told him, I mean, don't, you know, we're not satisfied by any stretch, but you can't ever apologize for a win. You know, you know we don't have to have the best players. We just have to have the best team. And our kids have bought into that. But, listen, potential doesn't. Potential is the worst thing you can have. Because that means you ain't done it. I hate the word potential. Somebody says you got a potential to have a good team. That drives me nuts. That means that means I'm not coaching right and they're not playing right. Welcome in to the latest episode of that SEC podcast. I'm your host, Michael Bratton. I go by SEC Mike on Twitter. And man, do we got a show lined up for you, flying solo on this episode, but reached out to a guest, gonna have Gentry Estes of the Tennessean gonna join the show. Talk some Vanderbilt football. I'm going to break down the Commodore spring game. And we've got some new odds that I want to talk about in addition to some other news and notes around the SEC. So let's get things rolling here. And as always, we got a viral clip or anything like that to start the show with. That's what we're going to do. And Nick Saban, you know, he's always good for a great quote, particularly when he's upset about something and just like every coach in the country, he's questioning this NIL during a uh, recent event down there in the state of Alabama. Nick Saban was asked about NIL, and he kind of dropped the hammer, man, because we all know at the end of the day it's all about money as much as uh, some people want to pretend it isn't. And front and center, Nick Saban's letting it be known, hey, our guys made more in NIL than anybody. You've spoken previously about the NIL and the opportunities it's presented to your guys. How has your opinion changed or developed, evolved since this began several weeks, several months ago? It really hasn't, you know, changed at all, you know. Um, you know I said in the very beginning that, you know, the concept of name, image, and likeness for players to go out and get representation and be able to work and make money using their name, image, and likeness is a good thing for the players. And I think that was the original intent. Um, now, people have started, you know, these collectives that raise money to create opportunities for players. Uh, I don't think anybody, I think that's an unintended consequence. We didn't do that last year, and our guys made more money than anybody in college football uh, on their own, you know, representing themselves, creating a good image, uh, being good players, uh, creating value for their themselves. Um, so we're going to do the same thing, but we're going to give everybody the same opportunity. Everybody in our organization will have the same opportunity, and then they can go earn as much as they want. Um, so um, we give everybody the same medical attention. We give everybody the same nutrition. We give everybody the same academic um, you know, support. Um, they have the same scholarship, so we're going to give them the same uh, opportunity in name, image, and likeness. And, then they can go earn whatever they want. But um, I don't know if it's a st- sustainable model for me to start picking and choosing who gets what opportunities. <laughs> so it is funny that uh, Saban kind of talks about these issues and the NIL and, you know, we need to legislate it. Then, you know, you hear comments like, yes, he's letting it be known that uh, the Crimson Tide lead the way in NIL, which I'm sure – He's selling on the recruiting trail. Not that he needs any extra pitches out there, but everything this guy says in a public setting is used to help his program, to help recruiting. And the transfer portal, that was an issue till they started using it. Up-tempo offense, that was an issue till they started using it. Alabama, they're getting on board with the NIL. Saban says they're already on board with the NIL based on these comments. So uh, I just thought that was interesting. We've had Kiffin come out here, Stoops come out here. A lot of these coaches, it's on their the front of their mind. But Nick Saban, he's smart enough to know he's not going to fight this thing. He's getting on board. And you come down to Alabama, we're going to take care of you when it comes to NIL. And the Crimson Tide recently started their own collective. So you knew it wouldn't take long. They weren't going to fall behind down there in Tuscaloosa. No, the rules are in place now. This is totally legal. 
Might as well get on board now, otherwise you're going to get left behind. Now, right before we hopped on the, the show here, some expected news out of Gainesville. The quarterback room has uh, been whittled down somewhat because redshirt freshman Carlos Del Rio, former four-star prospect, I believe, I want to say in the 2020 recruiting cycle, I may have that wrong, but he is leaving Billy Napier's program. And like I said, this was not necessarily that uh, Del Rio was going to be taken off here, but when you add Jack Miller, we've already seen Emory Jones go. Napier signed a guy out of high out of the high school ranks. We just had too many arms down here with the Florida Gators. Naturally, there was going to be some attrition. I think the Gators need to still have at least uh, a player to enter the transfer portal to to get under the scholarship numbers, if I'm not mistaken. So we all know, said it on this show, if you watch the spring game, it's apparent as if there was any question. Anthony Richardson, it's his show. Jack Miller, the transfer from Ohio State, they're grooming him to be the backup to one day potentially be the successor. But with that in place already, there's just there was no path to the field this season in Gainesville for Carlos Del Rio. So naturally, you're going to see a quarterback take off to uh, somewhere where he can potentially get on the field this season. Before we get to the Vanderbilt spring game, I wanted to try to hit on as many SEC teams as I could here. And we've got us uh, some updated Heisman odds via FanDuel Sportsbook. And interestingly, this is the only guy I'm going to mention that's not in the SEC. Ohio State quarterback C.J. Stroud, 2-1. to one. He's the favorite. He's even got better odds than Bryce Young, who's at 4-1. to one. Bryce Young's got the second best odds to win the Heisman repeat. Maybe that's why he's not as high. Just the fact that uh, there's only been one guy that's ever won the Heisman in back-to-back seasons. So, it's an uphill climb already for Bryce Young when you look at it from that angle. And it, it seemingly every year, the preseason Heisman favorites, for whatever reason, they have one rough game or performance or their team drops a game. The voters write them off. It's all about the new. Who's the new player that's emerging as one of the nation's best? Doesn't always go to the best player, in my opinion. So Bryce Young also got that working against him. But hell, 4-1 to one odds. I think most Alabama fans would sign up for that. Now, how about this? This is pretty fascinating and maybe give you an indication of not to put a ton of stock into these odds, but we got to talk about something here in mid-April. Jackson Dart, Ole Miss quarterback, who he's not even been named the starting quarterback here. He's got the second best odds, according to FanDuel, out of the SEC, 30-1. to 1. Just gives you an indication of the talent Jackson Dart has and the faith in Lane Kiffin to get him another quarterback ready to play in this system this offseason but like I said Luke Altmeyer, we're going to be checking out Jackson Dart Luke Altmeyer this weekend in the spring game that'll be one of the biggest storylines to watch this weekend in the SEC but hey according to FanDuel Jackson Dart the clear front runner for that job now here's a familiar name when you want to talk Heisman odds Spencer Rattler South Carolina quarterback 50 to 1 according to FanDuel those are that's probably about where I'd have him, maybe maybe even a little bit lower, just based on, again, I'm hyping up Spencer Rattler, but at the same time, I'm, I'm pumping the brakes when it comes to Heisman. I think uh, South Carolina, they don't need him to be the savior. They just need him to take that program to the next level, try to get to double-digit wins this season. Now, how about this one? Will Levis, Kentucky, 50-1. to one. Oh, Mike Morgan, appreciative of him coming on. If you missed it on the last episode, Mike Works for ESPN SEC Network. Called the Kentucky spring game. Very, very high on Will Levis. Says maybe the best, second best, excuse me, quarterback in the SEC. These odds, putting a little uh, faith in what uh, Mike's comments here. Will Levis 50-1 to to be the face of the Kentucky program this year. Then we got a couple of guys here at 60-1. to Hendon Hooker, Tennessee quarterback. Anthony Richardson, of course, Florida Gators quarterback. Will Anderson, Alabama outside linebacker, and Jameer Gibbs, Alabama running back, the transfer from Georgia Tech. And I'm going to throw one, one other non-SEC, but just gives you an indication of I ain't fully buying into these odds. JT Daniels, new West Virginia quarterback. Again, he's not even been named starting quarterback or anything. Didn't win the job at Georgia. 60-1 to as well, so 
J- JT Daniels is not going to win Heisman this year. <laughs> to have him with the same odds as Will Anderson is laughable. Jameer Gibbs could be a huge breakout candidate. That's one to circle potentially. And then Hendon Hooker, Anthony Richardson, they have massive, massive potential. They are realistic candidates, in my opinion. Continuing here with the SEC odds, Will Rogers like to see his name on the list. 80-1, to 1, Mississippi State's outstanding quarterback. K.J. Jefferson also with 80-1 to 1 odds to win the Heisman, Arkansas's quarterback. Jaden Daniels, LSU quarterback, the transfer from Arizona State. That's, that's pretty interesting right there. Jaden Daniels, 80-1 to 1 to win the Heisman. And then last but not least, Max Johnson, Texas A&M quarterback, transfer from LSU, of course. We're seeing Max Johnson, his name pop up more and more on these Heisman trophy odds here. So 80 to 1. I know those folks down at College Station, they love them some Haynes King, but do not write off Max Johnson. I gave you the odds. These are the best bets. I'm not saying these guys are going to win the Heisman, but I love where they're at when it comes to the odds. And for me, it starts. This is why I asked Mike this question. He's also a Heisman voter. So, hey, another reason to go back and listen to that interview if you missed it. Will Anderson, 60-1. to 1. That's my favorite bet on the board. He should be 6-1. to 1. I mean, I think you're, you're really taking FanDuel here if you bet Will Anderson at 60-1. to 1. My second favorite, been on this all offseason, been screaming it from the mountaintops. Again, not saying he's going to win the Heisman, but I love that he's being discounted across the board. K.J. Jefferson, 80-1. to 1. Sign me up for that. I'd put him closer to 8-1, to 1, maybe 10-1. to 1. Again, a very, very legitimate dark horse candidate if Arkansas continues to rise. K.J. Jefferson. And then I, I'm kind of splitting hairs here, but third and fourth favorite bets among these odds, in my opinion. I'm just going to go Anthony Richardson third, Hendon Hooker fourth, just for the simple fact that it seems like any time we discount the Florida Gators, they come out of nowhere and have one of their solid seasons. Maybe Billy Napier sprinkles some of that magic coaching dust that Dan Mullen seemed to <laughs> leave his body late last season. Florida does have a ton of talent. They don't have the depth they want. But who knows, maybe they put a 10-11 win season together, a magical ride here under Billy Napier. If that happens, you got to give Anthony Richardson some respect, and it's going to come because that those flashes we saw from Anthony Richardson last preseason, who looked like a legitimate Heisman candidate. If that's who the Florida Gators are getting all year, we got to – I think he, he's going to be among the finalists here in the upcoming season. And then Hendon Hooker, of course – so much to like about Hendon Hooker, year two in Josh Heupel's system. So many pieces back for the Vols. He is going to put up PlayStation numbers in this offense. So I like Hendon Hooker as well at 60 to 1. But right, we we not touched on Vanderbilt at all this spring. They've done a terrible job getting media out there and just updates are far and few between. But I was able to watch the spring game and break it down. And the quarterback competition, in my opinion, you know, Ken Seals has got the arm. He's flashed as a freshman, but I think you got to go Mike Wright. And that was the case in the spring game. Mike Wright with his legs, not only was he explosive, started the game with a 56-yard touchdown run. I don't think the Vanderbilt defense was allowed to touch Mike Wright, but they couldn't get to him anyway. So he's just making a fool of that defense on that opening drive. I think Mike Wright might be the most explosive player, not just at the quarterback position, that, but on the entire roster for the Vanderbilt Commodores. And again, that's not taking away anything from Ken Seals, who has an elite arm. But I just wonder if Vanderbilt, having the, all the issues they have on the offensive line, can you really roll out a, a more prototypical passer? Or you got to go with the guy that can be special with his legs. Ken Seals, a much better passer than Mike Wright. But, you know, he's going to be running for his life, whoever the quarterback is out there. So, you know, Ken Seals, he, he did convert a nice fourth Fourth and two in the second quarter, led a touchdown drive, several good passes on that drive. He did have a flea flicker play, though, wide open touchdown, getting rushed, bad overthrow, would have been a a wide open touchdown. So not the cleanest of performances for Ken Seals. And then uh, how about this true freshman here, 
which I had not heard much about him. AJ Swan, true freshman, early enrollee. He looks legit. I don't think he's a, a threat to unseat Mike Wright or Ken Seals as a starting quarterback there in Nashville, but it's fascinating that Vanderbilt, you know, they struggle to put a competitive team on the field here, but they looks like they got three quality quarterbacks, which is more than a lot of good SEC programs can say. So, hey, credit to the Commodores for having some depth at the game's most important position there. Other observations, number 14, Will Shepard. He looks like a legitimate go-to option there at receiver. Going to be the man there for the Vanderbilt Commodores, making some tough, tough catches. And it was not unique to the spring game. From what I hear, he's been doing that all spring during all these scrimmages. So Will Shepard, he was already a big-time playmaker for you. I think he's going to be your go-to guy. The offensive line? Still an issue, which is obviously a huge red flag here. It's been an issue for a number of years, but the reality is, if you know football, I mean, it takes time with the offensive line. It's a very developmental position group, and losing guys to the portal, left and right, sure ain't helping things there on the West End. So Vanderbilt offensive line is still going to be an issue based on what we saw in the spring game. I had kind of forgotten this, but Vanderbilt's returning about 95% of their rushing yards from last season. So, hey, there's a lot to like about Vanderbilt's offense taking that next step. Patrick Cheek Smith, number four, he looked like the best running back out there. Rocco Griffin, we've seen him make plays in the SEC. And the uh, the former Temple transfer, Ramon Davis, he's back for another year. And how about uh, four-star true freshman linebacker Daniel Martin with a nice fumble recovery. He was all over the field. Another early enrollee, a four-star it ain't often the Vanderbilt Commodores sign a four-star player. So to see an early enrollee coming in, making plays, look for Daniel Martin to be on the field early and often. And maybe the biggest eye-opening thing I saw in the Vanderbilt's spring game, you know, the defense was pretty atrocious last year, which is not what you expect under Clark Lee. It looks like they finally got uh, the mentality that they want under Clark Lee. I mean, they were physical, they were tough, and they were jawing after plays being made. And more importantly, the thing that really caught my eye, they got an unnecessary roughness penalty for throwing punches. And remember, they're playing their own teammates here. So, I mean, this defense has got an edge to them that it does not appear they had last season. That's that's something we talk about with Gendry Estes here. In just a moment, we'll kick it to them. But I wanted to kick it over to, to Clark Lee first, right after the spring game talked about the aggressiveness of his defense this spring, what he saw, what he liked, what he liked from that unit, and the quarterback competition exiting the spring. How's that going? And then finally uh, on Mike Wright and his incredible playmaking ability back there under center. Yeah, to that, you had a lot of gang tackling, some big hits and things, and I know you want to see how pleased were you with that aspect. Yeah, I mean, look, we, we, we're going to play against great competition, and, and – um, we're stronger together, and so when the ball gets in space, how fast are we closing space, and how many hats are we getting to the ball? That's going to be the name of the game. And when you do that, turnovers happen, which we saw today. And um, you know, you, you're you're in control of way more than you want to admit to um, in the competitive environment. And these guys are learning how to take take a handle of all the things they do control in the performance. But I was I was definitely pleased with that. I was pleased with. Um, the offense too. I thought we we had um, we took what the defense gave us. We were efficient with the ball. Obviously, I don't want to see the ball on the ground, but um, I can celebrate the fact that we're learning because we got both sides of the ball going really hard at each other. How would you evaluate the quarterback battle coming out of the spring? Well, I don't I don't know that uh, you know we'll unpack that all the way until we've had a chance to sit and watch the film and meet with them, but. Um, I was pleased with all three today. I mean, I think, you know, you saw aspects of each one of their games. They all three led scoring drives. They, um, they battled, um, you know, Mike in the first series on third and 10 takes the ball and tucks it and outruns everybody. We know he can do that. I thought Ken showed um, ability to, um, to be efficient and to make throws. And then I thought AJ, honestly, you know, he had the interception early. Um, but I like that. I mean, let's let's take risks. Let's bet on ourselves and take shots and learn from that. Um, you know, I thought he showed some uh, athleticism in the back half of the scrimmage, uh, evading rush and stepping up in the pocket. 
he was able to find receivers down down the field as a result, and um, you know that that's that's always a good thing. So um, I think we've strengthened the play at that position um, in in every facet. I thought we were really efficient with the ball today. I don't know what our completion percentage was, but it seemed like it was high. It seemed like we did a better job throwing and catching it. Um, now now it's time to sit down and kind of unpack the spring with them and figure out where we where we progress moving forward. Mike's big run for the touchdown, what did you see on that play? Just what makes Mike hard is that, you know, he was able to, to back out of the pocket. And um, he did it again later on. It was Daniel Martin on the second one at the second level that just took a bad angle. But um, as a pass rusher, you know, you're counting on that launch point being at a certain place. And so you're kind of setting the cage off that. And when you have a quarterback that can back out of it and then outrun you, um, it's just it's a challenge. And so he did that. And once he got into space, he was able to cut back and find the open seam. And, you know, it's always hard with the red jersey. You never know. Um, but it did not look to me like uh, we got close to him on that one. So, you know, I thought that was a, that was a score and that was a great play that he made, uh, you know, on his own, just, just creating. All right, so last thing here to hit on, the last thing to wrap up spring here in Nashville. Let's kick it over to our interview with Gentry Estes of the Tennessean. All right, we're pleased to be joined for the first time by Gentry Estes. He's a sports columnist for the Tennessean, and you got to give him a follow at Gentry underscore Estes. Gentry, thank you so much for uh, joining me, man. I, re I really appreciate you. Sure, good to be with you. You put in your headline here, Hope Springs a Turtle for Vanderbilt football, and finally for a good reason. Uh, of course, spring football, we're all in a good mood. We're all thinking our teams are going to be better than they were last year. But, uh, you know, based on your story there for the Tennessee, and, you know, there's actually hope for Vanderbilt football for the first time. So how much progress do you see coming in the second season under Clark Lee for the Commodores? I, I feel like it's it's it, they had an encouraging spring, and uh, as I wrote, you're, you're never going to hear a team say they had a bad spring. But when you watch Vanderbilt, uh, you know they had some roster turnover, but a lot of the key guys from last season they were able to get back. That was number one. Uh, when you watch them play, they just seem to to be playing at a different speed and confidence this spring than they had for a lot of last season. I think some of that has to do obviously with, with being in the second year of a scheme and a, and with a coach. And, and I think, expected. but in Vanderbilt's case, it was, it was encouraging to see, um, you know, I don't know what the upside is at Vanderbilt versus some other schools in the conference, obviously, you know, is it four and eight, five and seven, that kind of thing. That, that, that would probably be where I would put the over under, but, but that's better than last season. They went two and 10 last season. I do think they're going to be a good bit better, especially on the defensive side of the ball. And again, they've got some, some key guys back in a full recruiting class coming in. So I don't think they're going to be all the way there yet, but better. And how surprised were you that, uh, you know, considering how rough of a debut it was for Clark Lee and company that, uh, you know, there were some defections. Of course, they just had an offensive tackle that left for Alabama. But how surprised were you that they've been able to keep as much talent this offseason as they did? You know, I was a little surprised. I, I think you expect any time when you see a coach come in, you usually see attrition after the first season before the second season. Uh, it's pretty common that you're going to see that. And especially in this age of the transfer portal, I mean, I, I truly was, was kind of bracing for – for a lot of turnover at Vanderbilt. And, and there was some, but uh, quite honestly, not as much as I expected and not as much as I would have expected with some key positions. I mean, this can all change tomorrow, obviously, but for two years now, they have returned both quarterbacks in Ken Seals and Mike Wright. Um, I think that's kind of a neat trick there that they, that, that they weren't, one of them didn't choose to, to transfer during all this. And I think the first year that could have been Mike Wright because Ken Seals was was kind of the guy in Derek Mason's last season. Then this last season, Ken Seals dealt with some injuries and Mike Wright was kind of the quarterback. So, uh, you know, you assume, well, maybe Ken Seals goes somewhere else. He hasn't yet. He was here this spring. Uh, they also brought in a pretty good freshman quarterback in uh, A.J. Swan. So th they've got some good depth at quarterback, number one. Um, I feel like the skill positions – Still pretty good. They've got a pretty promising freshman and a kid named Jaden McGowan from South Carolina. He had a very early enrollee, had a very impressive spring. I think he's going to be a, 
a playmaker. They get they get the ball in his hands quite a bit this year. So, um, you, you know, I, I I think that's you bring in some new guys in addition to to a lot of the key guys that they brought back, and you know, defensive side of the ball, kind of at all three levels. They've got some guys who played some football for them. So, I think depth's an issue. I think they can get better on both lines of scrimmage. That was kind of the case last year as well. But um, if you, if you were to to list off the players and say here's the ones Vandy would most want to keep more than I would have thought. Mm -hmm. and, you know, you hit on the quarterbacks there, of course, Mike Wright. You know, I watched the spring game. He looks like potentially your most explosive player, of course, at quarterback, but maybe in the entire roster. And then Ken Seals, maybe a little bit more polished, maybe a little bit more prototypical what you want in the SEC. But given Vanderbilt's issues on the offensive line last season, you know, Mike Wright certainly thrived, I thought, a lot better than Ken Seals. Does that dynamic, the, the fact that they do different things, do you think that plays a part in uh, why they're they're both still there and they're both, uh, you know, vying for that starting role? Possibly. And, and I think there is there is a good bit of truth to that. But I, I think, um, you know, Ken Seals was, was, was awfully impressive as a freshman uh, in that last season with Derek Mason. He was one of the few bright spots on what was just an awful season in the, in the pandemic year for Vanderbilt. And, um, and again, you mentioned the offensive line. Well, it, it was a train wreck his first season. He was getting all kinds of punishment and still playing remarkable, all things considered. Uh, last season, the offensive line didn't really improve as much as, as you would probably hope from that. It was still an issue all season. And I do think, you know, Ken Seals was the starter when the season began and he dealt with some injuries. And I do think Mike Wright's ability to escape pressure uh, was was pretty useful, really, in their offense last season, given the fact that both quarterbacks just pretty much had no chance about half the time. I mean, I mean in, in all honesty, and I think, you know, Mike Wright had some escapability and 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 kind of made some some plays outside the pocket and. I think he got more comfortable as the season went along. And, uh, you know, I think Vanderbilt's team got more comfortable. They played better over the course of last season. They almost won a game at South Carolina. Uh, they they played Ole Miss a lot closer than they probably had anybody would have expected. And Mike Wright had a lot to do with that. He was a, He's a very strong leader for this team. Uh, and I think Ken Seals is too. And they're, they've been fortunate to keep them both around. Now, you mentioned the freshman receiver, Jaden McGowan. You like what you're seeing from him. But how about Will Shepard? I mean, he was making some big plays this spring, uh, particularly I'm talking about the spring game where, uh, you know, he looks like a legitimate go-to receiver in this offense. Do you think uh, he's going to be the man on the outside for the Vanderbilt Commodores? Uh, he's their best receiver, no, no question. Certainly coming back from last year. And, uh, you know, really the, the receiving core last year was better than I think it got credit. There was more talent in that group than, than you would expect. And, and Will Shepard was a big part of that. Uh, the ability to bring him back, I think, is is a big part of that passing game. They've got a few other guys. I mentioned McGowan and some other some others, maybe not quite as experienced, but they they've got some talent out, out on the perimeter. They really do, and they got they have all their running backs back as well. Uh, so the skill positions are okay. I think where this this is going to hinge uh, on Vanderbilt's real improvement offensively is, is going to be up front. I, I think that's still your your big question mark, and it's it's going to be hard for a team to it, it's it's you. I, I do think they're going to win a few games here and there that maybe people don't expect them to. But if you're really going to contend and challenge some of the better teams in this conference, you have got to be better up front than they, than I think they have been. And quite honestly, you're probably going to be this season. Mm -hmm. And now you wrote about the defense, Clark Lee. That's why we're bringing them in here to fix his defense. Pretty rough debut, but uh, you said they may not look like an SEC team talent wise, but they act like one. And I got to be honest with you, Gentry, I can't remember the last time I watched a spring game where we had defensive players getting uh, unnecessary roughness. I mean, they were throwing blows. They were talking crap in between plays. Uh, are you are you seeing that from the defense? Are you liking what you see? Are you, you think they've got that edge that Clark Lee wants them on that side of the ball? More so than last season, I do. Uh, there was a lot of uh, the, the scrimmage that I, that I wrote from in seeing that. Uh, they were very aggressive on the defensive side of the ball, and and you know, and, and and Clark Lee referenced this as well. A lot of a lot of gang tackling, a lot of uh, rallying to the football, and, and just just a confident looking group. They, you know, they 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 were proactive in how they were playing as opposed to being reactive. And I, I think some of that is just a comfortability in what they were doing defensively. 
but also I think there's an urgency to their play that that it has been developed uh, over the course of the last year. And I think they're, they're playing to a standard a, a lot better than it where they were certainly at the start of, of last season. And, you know, and some of that's personnel. Uh, they brought in a transfer from Clemson, uh, Kane Patterson, and as, as a linebacker in the middle of defense. And, you know, I think the, the secondary, you know, really at all three levels that they've got guys back who were, who were pretty key to what they were doing last year. And, and the defense at times played pretty well. I mean, you got Clark Lee's a guy who was a defense coordinator at Notre Dame uh, for some very, very good teams, playoff teams. So I, I think you, you've got a, a, a good scheme and a guy who knows what he's doing on that side of the ball. Uh, the, the trick is and will continue to be talent. But, you know, Anthony Orgy was probably the best player on the team, in my opinion, last year defensively. Elijah McAllister is another guy who was kind of in that, that same category. You know, the, these are guys that could have gone to some pretty big time programs and contributed and started had they wanted to transfer and they didn't transfer. That to me is probably the best sign of what they're building at Vanderbilt because after a team that didn't win and didn't win a game in 2020 and then went two and 10 last year, losing to ETSU to start the season, you're still able to keep the program together enough to where all these key players didn't want to leave and didn't view their best future to be somewhere else that they could get a lot, certainly a lot more wins. I think that above anything kind of shows what's being built there uh, just in terms of a confidence standpoint, because this is a program that the results on the field, you would have suggested that some players like of that caliber might, might've been looking elsewhere. In your mind, how big is the season opener loom on, on the season? It's a road trip to Hawaii. You reference it's there. You know, they lost the first game last year, ETSU. That had to just kind of spiraled the the positivity they had coming into the debut of the Clark Lee era. You know, they've got to continue this positive momentum they've got this offseason. So how how big is that Hawaii game? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's <laughs> it's a lot different. I, I think they're going to go out I don't know, 10 days a week before that game and uh, practice for a week in Hawaii and kind of enjoy. I mean, you're talking about a team that didn't have a bowl trip to end last season, right? So I think this is going to kind of be a, a reward, so to speak, to start the season. And they've got, they planned it out that way. I think it's, it's smart. I, I expect Vanderbilt to go out there and play pretty well. I mean, it, the follow-up to what happened when they lost to that game at ET, against ETSU last year, I think it ended up being somewhat of a wake-up call uh, for a team that had gone through the motions a little bit in the preseason and then, learned real quick they, that it was going to take more uh, for them to actually be competitive. And I think it said a lot about their character, if not in resiliency, if nothing else. At the very next week, they went to Colorado State and won a game on the road after that. I, I wouldn't have picked that. I was I did not think that was going to happen, and it did. So, you know, that, that's a team that went on the road and kind of found itself a little bit. I think that's kind of what they're hoping happens. Again, you know, going out to Hawaii and it, obviously a, a, a fun – place to be and practice and get ready for that first game all right last thing for you gentry i really appreciate all your time we're looking ahead to the schedule you know if vanderbilt is going to be taken seriously they got to be a lot more competitive in conference play like you referenced they almost knocked off south carolina they had some good showings late in the season if you had to pick one conference game that vanderbilt is most likely to win next season which game you going with South Carolina, to me, uh, would be the the most winnable of the group, probably, if only because uh, Vanderbilt had a very that, – that was a toss-up in Columbia last season. Vanderbilt was was in that game late, kind of let it get away at the end. Now, they you know, Carolina will be coming back to Nashville this season. And, um, you know, I know they bring in Spencer Rattler and, and a, a team and see a reason why they shouldn't mention them here. I – you know, you know, Florida has a new coach coming in. You know, what are they – how are they going to be in year one with Billy Napier? That could be another one. Um, you know, but I, I I do envision another year where conference victories would be few and far between for Vanderbilt. But it wouldn't surprise me if they get one or two. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks again, Gentry. I really appreciate your sports columnist for the Tennessee and give them a follow at Gentry underscore Estes. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all the Vanderbilt knowledge. All right, take care.
All right, so just want to say thanks to Gendry for hopping on the line. I, you know, I, I think Vanderbilt truly will win an SEC game this season. I think they're going to snap the streak. They're going to get somebody, at least one, if not two, SEC games. And if they're able to do that and win out in the non-conference, which is going to be difficult the way they schedule, they, they need to schedule more cupcakes until further notice. But if they can do that, you know, pull off some stunners, maybe go to a bowl game, that would be huge for this Clark Lee program in year two, given what he inherited and how awful they started out with that uh, ETSU opening season loss. I had no idea Vanderbilt was going out to Hawaii a little bit early. Love that move, but let's hope they don't party too hard because they got a game. If they drop the opener to Hawaii, it's going to be another long year for the Commodores. So let's hope they open the season by whooping Hawaii's ass here. But hey, that's going to do it. For this episode of the show, we got one more coming. Going to preview all the spring game action we've got on Saturday. So stick with us here. I really appreciate each and every one of you that continue to show up, even when we're talking Vanderbilt football. Hey, they're in the SEC too. You know, they deserve some coverage. So, <laughs> but that is going to do it on this episode of the show. We'll catch you on the next one. Hope I didn't lose too many of you by talking some Vanderbilt football, but... <laughs>